thank you all for coming out. I think it's a nice September evening. And, uh, the quote I heard the other day was, I love Maine summers. This year, I think it's going to be on a Wednesday. Uh, but I, I think it's really wonderful. Like, these are two uh, organizations that are close to my heart, the Mount Governor Museum and the Retired Skippers Race, of which now I'm old enough to sail in, as of one of the racers. But uh, I wanted to apologize for a little bit of bait and switch. This was the promotional picture that they used for this talk. And that is uh, myself on the Savannah Beal after my wife and all my family and everyone had just finished a winter's worth of work to get the schooner restored and sailed out of Belfast, Maine. And we did that for five years and it was great. But I looked at this picture and I went, wow, that's not the guy that's going to be speaking to you today. <laughs> so I wanted to, to send them my own promotional picture to use for this. <laughs> This one's a little bit closer. <laughs> this, was actually, this is actually kind of fun. The, uh, a friend of ours is a, uh, a, a, a photo visual, a photo artist, and she was raising money for MS. And so, if you gave her money, she knew you, and she would make this one of these for you. <laughs> so, if you were a lawyer, you'd have all kinds of crazy law things going on. But I thought it was pretty funny. Um, so I, I just wanted to introduce myself. I know a lot of people in the room, and it's really nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, some, some from way back. That's past passengers with the Sublime of Beam uh, from 1981. Uh, the uh, uh, background that I... Oh, I'm not ready yet. Don't you like it? Uh, my, my background briefly is... Uh, my parents moved to Searsport back in 1968. Uh, we lived in the Homeport Inn here in Belfast and Searsport. I graduated from Searsport High School, which was kind of interesting. I'd gone to schools with thousands of kids, and I would have graduated a class of 69 students. Um, I love Searsport. It's a great, great place, uh, and it's, it's got a lot of history that uh, is very appealing to me. And I think that uh, my career has sort of been like a divining rod. Every time I try to do something, it just like goes right out to the water. So I've been working on the water since uh, out of college. I started working as a deckhand on the schooners in Camden, and then my wife and I ended up purchasing an old hull and rebuilt it. Uh, then we uh, uh, kind of got involved with a tugboat company in Belfast, and then I ended up running the tugs for 15 years. And then I went over, I sold that to my partner, and went over to Maine Maritime and started teaching there, and then running the schooner Bowden. And then I just retired from there two and a half years ago, but I'm apparently failing at retirement, as is my <laughs> wife, Trish. Um, we're both uh, semi-retired, so Trish works part-time as a judge, and I work part-time as a ferry captain and a tugboat captain. So I just want to give that a little bit of background, and then talk about uh, this trip that we did. And I was invited to talk about this trip. So, this is what they call a kite, and this is Maine. This is all the way down Anaswan uh, on uh, Cape Ann. This is the Cape Cod Canal. This is up to Providence. This is the Long Island Sound. And then the kite actually begins in New York City. Uh, you go up the Hudson to uh, Waterford, Troy, and you join the Erie Canal and go up this way to and then there's a place here called Three Forks, where keep that glittering. How about that? Uh, Three Forks, which you can continue on the Erie Canal to to Erie, or you can go off to Oswego. So uh, the kite goes off to Oswego, and then you cut across the, the uh, uh, eastern side of Lake Ontario, and you join the St. Lawrence Seaway, and then this is the St. Lawrence Seaway, and you go all the way through there just about uh, halfway between Montreal and Quebec to a place called Sorel. And then from Sorel, you work your way down the Chambly Canal, Chambly Richelieu River, into Lake Champlain. And then you join the Champlain Canal, which runs all the way down. And you end up closing the kite back down in Waterford. And it, it was an epic trip. For those that are, you know, like to know stats and uh, figures, we went through uh, 23 locks to Three Point on the Erie, eight locks to Oswego, seven locks on the St. Lawrence, nine locks on the Chambly, and 11 on the Champlain. So we did 58 locks. We got really good at locking. <laughs> uh, the engine ran for about 295 hours. The 
maximum altitude that we got was 420 feet above sea level. So you'd go into a lock, and some locks you'd go up 15 feet, sometimes you'd go up 45 feet. Uh, and you kind of keep locking up, and then when you kind of reach a certain point in the river, I mean in the canal, you start locking back down, and you, you're pretty much locking back down once you reach uh, three points there towards Oswego. And it's a really interesting trip, so I'm going to try and give you some sort of highlights of the trip. Uh, the way the trip got started, uh, the way the trip got started is actually uh, Declan and Peggy O'Connor in the audience, and we went to Ireland with them, and while we were there we said, we've got to do the Shannon Waterway in Ireland. And you can rent canal boats there, and you can go through it. But I, I had it in my mind that before we did that, which we still will do, uh, we were we should really do the American canals and the important American canals. The Erie Canal is uh, 200 years celebration this past year, 2018, and it's called Clinton's Ditch. It was a huge and amazing project that took many, many, many years to develop. And it was uh, probably uh, one of the most important parts of the Industrial Revolution, you know, joining Pittsburgh and Erie and the Great Lakes. You know, the Rust Belt with the, the, the big cities of New York. Right now, it's a little sad. There's very little commercial traffic still on the, this uh, waterway. But the year that Trish and I went there, it was uh, free. The locking was free because they were celebrating their 200. And the locks are beautiful and very well maintained, which is kind of interesting. It's mostly for recreational traffic. Uh, so we, Trish and I looked, went out and found this boat we thought would be perfect for it. We named it Good Company after a song that a friend of mine wrote. And we also wanted it to be a boat that would be able to accommodate two couples comfortably. So we call it our floating Winnebago. Actually, this is, this is kind of funny. My, my son, I took him out on a ride. I, I got my new call sign. That was it. And he said, do you get to pick your call sign? And I said, no, you don't get to pick it. He goes, well, that's your initials backwards. And then 89 is when you bought the tugboat company, and 82 is my birthday. <laughs> Pretty easy one to remember. Excuse me. So there, there's our vessel. Anybody that's over in Belfast at Nautilus Restaurant, it's, uh, it's right there now. So what we, uh, the way we started the trip was just about a year ago today, or three days ago, we, we left here, just Trish and I, with the idea that we would pick up friends as we went along. Another thing that was sort of interesting about the trip is that because I was teaching for 13 years at the academy, I know a lot of people that are running tugs and barges and ships. So we were encountering them all throughout our trip. Uh, our first night, we left here, just the two of us, and our lovely dog, who unfortunately passed away this year, but he got to do the Erie Canal. He was the prince of the Erie Canal, Piper. Uh, this is uh, Warren Island, for those of you uh, are familiar with that. That was our first stop. Just get down, get away from Belfast, start to get the boat shaken down and get ready to go. This is just a great picture my wife took uh, down in uh, the Royal River. So we cruise Maine to get down to Portland. These are just some shots cruising down the coast. This boat is, there's my dog. Uh, this is coming down to Monroe Island near uh, uh, Owl's Head. That's my wife. The very important component of this trip. Cruising, for those that are cruisers here, cruising has really changed a lot. Uh, there are all types of waterway guides, you know, you've got your computers. So when we were looking for places, we had to stay at a marina every night. And the reason was for many reasons. One is that our dog was so old, we couldn't get him in the dinghy and get him ashore. So we stayed, so we were a month and a half, we were at a marina every night. So the marina world is a whole other world. But there are many, many of these marinas. So Trish, that was her major job. I'd get underway and I'd say, these are the places that I can make today. So we would stop every night and I'd say, I can make Port Clyde, Christmas Cove, and then she would get on and see what was available there for marinas, and then you could call them on the phone and make arrangements to be there that night. So that's Trish right now, probably getting ready to look up uh, where we're going next. That's our boat. It's a perfect boat for this. I think it was actually designed for this type of work. It is very slow. People said, oh, you're not going to like to go so slow, because my other boat went 20 knots. This one goes seven and a half. 
<laughs> but if you're going seven and a half in a straight line, uh, you can really eat up a lot of miles. And one of the things that it has is fairly decadent. It has an autopilot with a remote control. <laughs> so I can get the vessel going in a nice straight line down the coast and then put it on autopilot. And then I can walk around the boat and go get coffee. And if I see a lobster buoy, I can push the little button and move it to the right a little bit, move to the left a little bit. But if you're going to be eight hours or nine hours on the wheel steering, that would wear you out pretty fast. So uh, the boat did it seven knots. I do 56 to 60 miles per day. And this actually is uh, just a little cruising picture. I think it was taken over in Bar Barlands. Anyway, so the interesting part about this was it was Trish and our, uh, sort of a just main <laughs> another picture of the boat. Still a main. <laughs> We ate really well. <laughs> One thing that was really important for us in cruising on this boat is we wanted to be comfortable. So the boat is set up, it has a refrigerator, a gas stove, it has an oven, it has showers. Uh, so it's really, it is pretty comfortable, uh, which I'm not used to on boats. I usually generally go out and, you know, uh, a box of wingdings and three Pepsis and I'm ready to go to Boston. <laughs> but uh, with, with Trish on board, we had really good food. And because we were stopping at night, day and night, we weren't out there, you know, slamming around while we were having dinner. I, I just thought everybody ought to have pictures like, you haven't have been to Facebook yet. You've seen, seen what your friends are eating. <laughs> so this is one of my students when we got down to Portland. This is uh, Spring Point. You see Fort, Fort George just behind us. And this was one of the really fun parts, I think, for my wife and I, is that we stopped in a lot of places, and because we were on Facebook and Instagram, a lot of students would track us down and come down to the boat, and we'd kind of find out what we're doing. This particular guy is a tech boat captain uh, for McAllister Towing now. Uh, but the marina life is really fun because it makes it easy for people to find you and to track you down. Had anything that's tugboat, I have to go there. Uh, Trish, Trish actually took this picture down at Booth Bay. And there's my dog. <laughs> uh, this was, after we left Portland, we headed down, and a place I'd never been through was the Anasquam, which is a very ch tight channel, very sandbar-y uh, approach. Sand, and uh, the, the depths are very questionable as you go through, so you try and go through at high tide with the tide coming. And I uh, did uh, manage to uh, go around there for about 15 or 20 minutes. And it was kind of interesting. I was right. My chart where it was great. I was going along and I made this turn. And all of a sudden, I just kind of felt the boat kind of... <laughs> and the scary part was is that it was... But it was also being sl slightly pushed off the channel into shallower water. So I started working the engines and Trish was kind of watching for me and we got ourselves out uh, and the tide was coming and eventually it just flipped it up and then another boat wanted to go by but I was aground so he couldn't uh, and as he came by, he, then all of a sudden he did he came way inside of where the chart showed and he went around that corner he was a boat of my draft so I realized that there was some local knowledge there and so I immediately got out and went that way and I, I got down to the marina and I was kind of complaining to the marina said, well, that chart's not right she goes, oh yeah, we've been asking him for two years to dredge that out. <laughs> Maybe you should tell people. <laughs> it was beautiful. This, once you get in through here, you're, you're like just 10 or 15 feet from people that are uh, sunbathing. And... So anyway, we had a great stop there. We went to Gloucester. <laughs> then we made a kind of a run line for the Cape Cod Canal. We saw some students in Gloucester. We saw students in Gloucester. They were running a student adventure down there. And uh, we... Just kept uh, having little visits with folks all the way along. This was one of our favorite stops. I think Trish will agree. This was uh, a place called Cutty Hunk. Uh, when you come out of uh, Buzzards Bay, there's a series of islands called the Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Elizabethian, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Islands. And this particular one is at the very end. It's called Cutty Hunk. And it's a very uh, tricky entrance. It's very fairly shallow, well buoyed, but it's tight. And I really always wanted to go there because I had done a delivery back in the 70s and we were going to stop there one night in bad weather, but we couldn't get in because it was so foggy. We didn't have all the tools that we do now, charware, so I never got in. 
So Trisha and I stopped there, and it turned out that our, one of my students runs an oyster farm there. And so we got some really delicious <laughs> sandwiches. So what does he ship out for in his spare time? He ships out for one of the big container companies, Crowley, I think. Trish is my uh, fact checker here tonight because. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, Sam uh, Garrison. He, he actually runs this place. And they have a really great gig there. So you can see our boat right behind uh, over here. And I was alongside. And some people go out and pick up uh, like a stake and they hang on it. And then what he, he did is he had all these college kids and this big, wide boat. And they would go out to every boat with all these fresh oysters and sell them, and then shuck them right there for you. And he had a, a landslide that they were just making a fortune. We were early in the season. Apparently, you can come in here and not be able to get a berth. And you can hardly anchor because there isn't very much room. But it was a great spot. So after this place, we had that. We were starting to uh, make our schedule. There's the boat. But, yeah. So, Part of my plan was, with Trisha and I, we were going to pick up couples along the way. Some of you guys know uh, Phil Dion, uh, and Phil and his wife Gay live in, uh, in Connecticut now, I mean uh, Rhode Island. And so Trisha and I had to scoot across from Cuddy Hunk to Providence. That was the kind of one of the only challenges of the trip I found, is that uh, we did have sort of a schedule. So that really kind of made uh, a lot of planning have to happen, and that was one of the trips that Trish and I had, which you won't see any pictures of because it wasn't very pleasant. Uh, running from Cuddy Hunk up to Providence, it was unforecasted southeast winds, beam sea, five, six feet. Uh, my dog was getting sick. Uh, uh, but you know, that was, I, I would say Trish, probably the only really bad weather day, except maybe coming around the Battery. Manhattan. Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, return trip. So a lot of people call uh, Fill my stunt double. Um, <laughs> and the reason they call him that is I took Phil with me on a boating trip up to Newfoundland. And when I wanted to take a nap and people were walking around the boat, I'd go, Phil, go up and stand up on deck. <laughs> and then he would answer questions for everybody. <laughs> I tried one day of fishing. This is a really sad, sad thing. I've owned several boats that are like sport fishermen. Great fishing boat, Grand Banks fishing boat. I have never caught a fish in my life. <laughs> but my son-in-law gave me a reel. I tried it. It, was, it wasn't working, so that was it. Uh, as we went, uh, after we picked them up, we stopped several places on Long Island Sound. Some are unremarkable. Uh, Branford is a little town we stopped in. Uh, Point Judith uh, was kind of interesting. This is coming into New York, uh, and this is. Uh, the Frog Neck Bridge, that's where May Mara, uh, Mass Maritime is over there? No, New York. New York. Kings Point. Uh, SUNY, yeah. Another nice picture of our friends. Well, Gay really wanted to go to uh, Ellis Island. And you can't take your boat to Ellis Island or the Statue of Liberty. You have to go by one of the ferries. And so I was a little worried about picking up a marina in New York City. <coughs> but they said, we'll pay for it. Great. So uh, we went to a place, this is over on the New Jersey side, this is called Liberty Marina, and oh, it's an unbelievable marina, you know, it's like the toilets were in the uh, facility and everything was just marble and beautiful, and it was $290 a night. Wow. Yeah, you could stay at a hotel for that. <laughs> but it was a perfect spot, and the reason it was perfect was the ferry that goes to Ellis Island and uh, Liberty that leaves with one leaves from New Jersey right at the end of this where we were tied up. So in the morning, while I did maintenance on the boat, Trish and uh, the, the uh, Gay and Phil went out to Ellis Island. Trish, you, that was a pretty good. It was good. I it wasn't on my list. I didn't have any expectations, but I loved it, and it was a really good maritime museum. There was a lot there about of maritime history, of how people lived and what happened in that certain half a century, how people got into the United States by sea. It was fun. It was really cool also that you can imagine how beautiful that was at night with the skyline right behind the boat. Yeah. So that was our big city experience. So then from there we headed, started heading up, there's a nice picture of the statue. Mm -hmm. 
This is uh, departing New York and starting to head up the Hudson. I think that's actually Bear Mountain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really fun for us to go up the Hudson. Uh, this was kind of a great stop. All of our kids read The Little Lighthouse. Do you remember the book, The Little Lighthouse? Yeah. The Little Red, Red Lighthouse and the Great Great Bridge. There you go. <laughs> and, and there it is. It's under the D&W, right? And it's a story about the little lighthouse that was going to be torn down because the bridge was there. And then one day the, the lights in the bridge went out and because the lighthouse was there, the ship didn't go around or something like that. But our kids all grew up with that story, so we had to, had to take that picture. <laughs> but we had a really fun time on the Hudson. Uh, our son went to uh, West Point, so we did a lot of visits down to New York and we really enjoyed that beautiful area down there. And it was kind of fun to go see it all from the water. This is the uh, Sloop Clearwater, uh, Pete Seeger's vessel that he brought to oh, the, yeah, yeah. and it runs trips up and down the Hudson uh, year round, or throughout the summer and fall. And it's just a beautiful vessel, and it, it's uh, you're, you're pretty likely to encounter it when you're going through. So that's New York City behind us as we're heading out. This was kind of a little shot at pan panorama. This this is to me a iconic picture of the of the Hudson, you know, with those beautiful mountains on both sides. Uh, as you get further up, you see these gorgeous mansions, uh, famous, famous uh, wealthy people have always uh, loved, you know, spent a lot of time on the Hudson. But this is uh, moving our way up towards uh, uh, Storm King. Storm King. It's another lighthouse on the mm -hmm. Hudson. This is uh, West Point. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> well, that's that one shouldn't be there. <laughs> So, I kind of abbreviated a little bit. We went up the Hudson. Uh, we stayed at a couple places there. One was uh, Ossining, where Sing Sing Prison is. You say, why would you want to go there? Well, it turns out weather made us go there. Uh, but we found this really nice marina. It was run by a uh, father and son. And the prison is up on the hill way up in the back. You can see it. It was a really neat spot that we were trying to pick places that were kind of off the beaten path. It was a great marina. We had a great time there. Uh, we stopped at a couple other marinas on the way out. And we would just kind of pick them as we went. There were none that were terrifically remarkable, um, but they you know, they were always pleasant people there, and uh, it was really fun. And then at Albany's connecting, Albany Rensselaer, we picked up Jim and Linda. Yeah, so our first crew change was at Albany Rensselaer, so uh, Jim and Linda are here tonight. They, uh, they joined us, and Phil and Gay got on a train, and trained right back to Rhode Island. <coughs> and these guys rented a car one the way, so they came down and joined us, and so and then we, we went to, we started, we actually started the canal. So what's interesting about it is, is that there is no lock number one on the Erie Canal. And one might ask why there is no lock number one. Well, the lock that was number one is actually out on the Hudson, and now it's the federal lock. They call it federal lock one. And then from then on, you start the Erie Canal. So once you get up to uh, Waterford, you stop there. Normally you pay a fee to go through the locks. And it's usually like a 10-day pass, and you can lock all you want. Uh, they are really great. They give you a lot of information. They tell you about a lot of marinas. And they uh, give you the sort of the instructions for doing it. They stand by on, a channel, on channel 13. And when you're ready to lock up, you call them. And you, you say, uh, this is the Motor Vessel Good Company. We're, we're down at lock two. We're ready to, ready to begin. And they'll say, uh, just stay where you are, we'll call you. And when they get like four or five vessels, or as many as are around, they'll get them all to come in. And it's quite a procedure to lock. This picture isn't a lock, but this one is a flood control dam, so that if the waters start to get really high, they drop these things down, and you can't pass. But that only happens in a little severe weather. But we'll probably get a picture of the lock. So the first one is called the steps and it takes you up uh, rapidly like I think it's like a hundred feet above sea level and it's it's uh, six locks bang 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 they're all within like uh, four or five hundred yards of one another and as you're going up them you can see these huge waterfalls on the side so the river that kind of parallels Clinton Ditch the Erie Canal is the Mohawk so the Mohawk is flowing around you and a lot of times you'll come up and you'll see where the lock is and then there'll be like a whole bunch of red buoys. It's like, don't go that way because you'll go over the waterfall. 
Um, and then you start to come into the lock. It was really fun that you could see the condition of the locks. They're in really great shape. And one thing that was kind of interesting is you have to learn all the different types of locking uh, attachments as you go through. This one, these just had ropes that hang over the side. So you, you were required to have two people on deck, and they all have to have PFDs. And as you come in, they'll kind of, usually they'll direct you, but if there's only two boats, you need to figure it out. And you try and stay at the back of the lock if the water's going down, and, and the head of the lock if the water's going up. But it didn't seem to make much difference to me. But sometimes you do have to go on one side or the other because some of the water that flows in is supposed to come in evenly. <laughs> but if it doesn't, it'll just blow you right off. Uh, and it causes quite a bit of problems. So <clears throat> this one, you just pick up these ropes, and then everybody has to like stand there and hold the ropes. And then as you're going up or down, they just kind of keep the boat even there. You don't tie them off. And it can get a little exciting uh, when the water starts really ripping in there. Uh, and it, I was really impressed, though, with how the canals were laid out and how nice the people were that run these locks. They were, they're just very... So there's, there's a, this was a pretty good size one. Uh, this is after we've locked, and the door is now locked in, and now the door is shutting. How long does it take, John? Most of them, I would say, like if you're going like 30 feet, which is a pretty good size lock, it might take 10 minutes, 15 oh, minutes. Yeah. Sometimes you would have to wait longer just because the, the lock people were doing whatever they do. Yeah, it was more of the waiting on the other end. There's plenty of places to tie up, or if there were a lot of people, you could kind of just hang out in the stream. But it was more the waiting than the actual locking process. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it went pretty fast. Like that, those six locks, we did that in about two and a half hours, I think. And then once you're through that, so this was kind of fun too. Uh, so one thing I learned in the cruising world is that our boat is made for New England. I have a furnace on our boat. <laughs> no air conditioning. Well, on the Erie Canal, it was like 100 degrees. And at one point, uh, my dog, who's not a real brave dog, we were tied up waiting to lock, he just got off the boat and went over into the shade. <laughs> like, man, are you kidding? And at one point, we, so we didn't have air conditioning, so at one point, we were in a place called Kanjahari, and Linda and Jim went in with Trish and bought every fan you could buy at Rite Aid. Uh, because I did have AC, I had power, I mean, I had power, so I could run fans. But it was really different for me, because cruising in Maine, it's, it's pretty unusual, even in the middle of the dog days of August, that it's so hot on the boat that it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Because you can you lay it in an anchor, the wind's blowing down the vessel, you can find a place that has a little breeze, it usually drops down into the 60s at night, even if it's 80 during the day. But on the canal, there's just really very little wind. So that was kind of an interesting development for us. Um, and actually, it, this was... Of course, you're probably going to see a lot of picture of tugboats. These are these are the canal, uh, New York canal, New York canal system tug companies that run there. And some of these tugs are like 1870 because they're in fresh water. You can see that she's riveted. And I would, some, I would go by and get their dates. There was a couple that were 1890, uh, 1901, and very kept in great shape. And being in the fresh water, they'll just go forever. Some of the locks, you know, would have little trees growing in them. <laughs> I can't remember which one that one was. There's also, uh, a lot of times there'll be a, like a bridge that has to be, it's put down to make you not go any further than you're supposed to, and then they'll lift that just before you go through. This is kind of a nice little panorama. This is really what the Erie Canal looks like for lots and lots of it, as it widens up. It has wide parts and then it has narrow parts. The true original Erie Canal that you always see, that I, I don't know how many times we sang, No Bridge but Down, uh, where they were real narrow and the mules used to pull them along. Well, those, there's only a few places that are like that, and most of that is in the original Erie Canal that runs on to New York. Uh, a lot of it opens up and it widens up, so vessels could, uh, would, would count on other tugs to tow them through these areas. And even back in the day, they would have steam tugs that would do that. But there was a time when they actually did tow them along with mules. And you'll see a few places where that was uh, possible. So 
So every lock you come to would have like this little information sheet. So this is lock 19 in Schuyler, New York. So the upstream elevation is 404. So I took this one, this was the highest that we got. And then the downstream is 383. So I was actually starting to lock down after this. And locking down is a lot more fun than locking up. Because when you lock up, you're going into like this cavernous, smelly, big chamber. And you, you, you have to hold on. So I mentioned that there were the lines you hold on. Well, they're really, really long on their way up. The other kind they would have is a bar. They'd have these pipes that were recessed. And you'd put your line around that. And then you would just kind of let it slide up as you go. What was the other, was the other kind of trick? Was that one? There was... Uh, there's only the slider on it. Oh, there was, yeah, there was the, the floating bits. The, 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 those were more on the same words, but the, it's like a bit that's, that floats, goes up with you. And those were, those were real nice, because uh, they make it real easy. But it tells you also when the next, next westbound lock is. So the next one is 10.28 miles away, and the eastbound one is 12 miles. So it gives you a lot of information that's very helpful. Uh, it gets a little tedious after you've seen it thousand of them but <laughs> and this is lock two in Fulton New York upstream elevation 352 so this is now when we're on the Oswego I believe yeah this is on the Oswego canal and it's kind of interesting how that comes along so you you go through the canal and you'll end up in Lake Oneida all of a sudden the canal turns into a lake and then you get back in sort of the waterways again and then all of a sudden there's like this little <coughs> junction in the river and it goes <coughs> Buffalo that way, Oswego that way, and you just, uh, that's where you make your decision where you're going to go. We decided not to go the whole canal because if you go there and we wanted to continue our kite, we'd have to go up Lake Erie and through the Welland Canal back into Lake Ontario. And that's a huge shipping canal, it's very it's expensive, it's uh, $60 a locking or something like that, so we decided not to do that. More tugboats. Moving a little second. Most of the commercial or you know busy traffic that happens here is people maintaining the, the, the uh, waterway. These are just some pictures I put in of how you know, these beautiful bridges you'd see. Uh, this one I liked because I don't know if I can do it, but I can't. But if you flip this around, this looks like stars. <laughs> but it was a daylight. This is just like little glitter on the water. And so when I first saw it, I said, "What?" When are we running at night? And then I, I realized it was upside down. I think this was a, a Linda Tire photo. And this is my helper and, uh, and, and uh, Piper. <laughs> this is Dr. Jim and Piper. Piper really was the prince of the canal. They loved, they loved to see the dog. Uh, they would talk to him and give him treats. And he was handling it pretty well. And uh, this is as we're getting ready to pick up our lines to lock through. This is out in Lake Oneida. This picture actually really makes me uh, grumpy. And the reason is, I'm a merchant mariner. And the, you never want to see people with their fenders hanging over. <laughs> but the reason I got used to that was through the canal, you leave your fenders out the whole time. If you didn't, that's all you'd be doing every five, 20 minutes. So we got out in Lake Oneida and I had fenders on both sides, and it was fresh water, it was really nice, we all went swimming, it was gorgeous, and as I, I'm out there swimming around, I went, wow, that looks really good to seamanship. <laughs> <laughs> so, one thing I forgot to mention, too, was uh, the other considerations. The minimum and the maximum draft is six feet through the Erie Canal. And, but it's truly more than that. There's only a few places that are like that, and you can avoid some of them by going, you know, not like what, what we did going through Oswego instead of going through the area. But then they have what they call uh, air draft, how tall you are. And it's 22 feet through the Erie Canal, and then uh, the Champlain Canal, which is on the other side coming out of Lake Champlain, that one, they said it was 17 feet. Well, with my mass down and everything, I was just 20 feet with the bimini up. So we had this little team thing where we would tip that mass down and, and get it located at crutch and that's below that so that I know that was my maximum altitude but when you go through the Cham uh, Champlain Canal they say 17 feet well it was kind of interesting because 
at one point we're going through the canal, and I, I just said, man, I don't know, that looks lower than that. So I had my bimini down, and I measured that I was uh, 16 feet to the top of it, to the top of the radar. And behind me was this another boat like ours, a little bigger, fancier, a couple of about our same age. And they had their full bimini up with eyes and glass all over it. And, and I <clears throat> look back at him as I'm going, I'm like, I don't think he's going to make it under there. <laughs> so as we got up, I literally could touch the bridge with my hand. Mm -hmm. And I did that, and then I looked back at him. And he came a little bit further, and then he went, oops. <laughs> so he went back, and it was, he was probably a day at least at the dock taking that all down. It was quite a fancy system. But luckily he didn't go through it face first, because that wouldn't have, probably would have ruined the trip for him. <laughs> this is one thing that was a little sad in some places. There's a huge growth of milfoil oh. in a lot of the harbors. This was one harbor. Trish, can you remember the name of that one? It was that one where, 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 where we went up and... Battle. Well, I don't want to say that I remember it because of the brew pub, but I remember it because of the brew pub. <laughs> and it was on the Champlain Canal, uh, back down towards Lake Champlain, and it was Battle Hill. Yeah, you know, I'm going to trust you on that one. But when, when some of these places you come into, and you'd see there was plenty of water for the vessel, but when you come in, it looked like land everywhere. And so you're motoring through it, and I have overboard discharge so for, for my cooling. And I was a little concerned I would clog that up, and a couple times I did have to uh, stop and clean the filter, clean it out, uh, because it does just draw it right in. And you can see why people are worried about it. The other one they worry about out there is called zebra mussels. Yeah. And they are like little tiny mussels that get into your, your coolant, says coolers, and then they grow, and then they start clogging everything up. Well, we fortunately weren't in there long enough to do that, and by the time we, you know, we were only there for a few weeks, and by the time we got back, we're back in seawater that kills them. But I was checking that all the time. It's very uncomfortable, though, when you're going through what looks like land on your boat. You know, it's kind of like a little portage. So here, you can see how, how that water rips in there when it's, uh, when it's full, uh, filling. So here's the uh, junction of three, they call it three corners. And Erie Canal, Oswego that way, 24. Buffalo that way, 132. The air draft does reduce from Buffalo on, so if you're going that way, you do have to get down to 17 feet, which would be like the Champlain. I think one of the things that was sad about the trip is how industry is like gone there. You know, you have all these big factories, like Kanjahari was one place we stopped. It was a famous for the Beech Nut Company, Beech Nut Products, mm -hmm. and basically they just left. You know, you know, they went out of business completely. But, you know, these, there's factory after factory, there's power mills that are just not doing anything anymore. It's, uh, it's a little, that part, is, it's a little ghost towny. This was uh, Kanjahari where we bought every fan that you could possibly buy. <laughs> and these, this is what I was talking about with the waterfalls on your right as you're going along. Mm, just beautiful. That actually was kind of nice because that action kind of brings some cool air around yeah. it. So. Sometimes I want to just stay right there. So finally, we made it through into Oswego, and this is looking out onto Lake Ontario. And I think the, can you remember the lighthouse? Anybody remember Thomas Light? Well, that's the big breakwater that take that you look right out onto Lake Ontario. And it was really interesting for me. I've done a little bit of sailing on the Great Lakes, but the Great Lakes are instant weather. Uh, you you'll look out one day, it'll be flat calm. You could probably water ski across it, and then. Uh, Two hours later, a northwest wind will come up and it'll look like that. It'll be white water, short waves, very uncomfortable, very tight together waves. And so we fortunately didn't have to go out that day. We waited because this was where we did another crew change here. We uh, had Peg and Deck O'Connor join us. There's Peg going to work right there. Um, and uh, we had to cross Lake Ontario, but by then the weather had changed. Oswego is a kind of an interesting place. It's a it's got a college element to it. Uh, actually, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Uh, it's, it's a real interesting town, but there's a lot of uh, high-speed, super-fast sport fishing boats. And we were next to one that had 
you looked inside, you must have had 10 million lures in there, and the thing looked like it would go like 90 knots. Uh, it was called Blood, blood Catch. <laughs> so when we left there, we started to cross Lake Ontario, but we, only, we left it later in the afternoon, and we just by chance went to this pretty little lighthouse town called uh, Selkirk. And it was really nice. These people had a little museum there, and everywhere we went, I'll have to say, on the whole trip, people were really, really uh, pleasant and Enjoyable. This was a little lighthouse, which was really fun, <clears throat> and a little cookout. This is a uh, Selkirk. That's the entrance. That's that would be out looking out into Lake Ontario. Trish bought me a shirt. <laughs> oh, and this is what some of our guests do on board. <laughs> this would be my friend Declan. So after we got across the, we weren't very long in Lake Ontario to get to the beginning of the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Thousand Islands. So I had uh, the O'Connors on for a few days there, so we kind of went up into the Thousand Islands, and we stopped at a place called Clayton, which has got a very famous uh, wooden boat museum there. And it was really fun to go and look at all the wooden boats and the motors. But the sad part was, and uh, some of my Searsport friends will remember this, I, they had a snowmobile there. Oh, it was a Polaris snowmobile that was in their museum. <laughs> it was the exact same one I had when I was in high school. <laughs> That's not right. <laughs> but they had, for, for outboard motor people and wooden boat people, they were all over the place. So this is entering the St. Lawrence Seaway, and now you're starting to get in and play with the big boys. This is a very, very busy commercial shipping lane, and it's well charted. But it's very busy, so we were starting to really pay attention in there and try and tuck around into places where we could uh, stay out of the major shipping lanes. But it is pretty well charted and documented, and uh, you, you do not, like that sailboat in the news, have right-of-way over vessels uh, moving in a channel uh, when they are power vessels, uh, ships like this. And we made it then to Kingston, Ontario, actually a little town named up there called Bath. And we, our friends uh, Larry and Sharon Jones, welcome to know them, they joined us there. Deck and Peg brought, uh, they, they brought the car back that these guys came. I thought we were very clever on our ship. <laughs> uh, and we had backtracked a little bit up to, and now we cleared customs in Canada. We actually went into Canada. So the first time when the, when the O'Connors were on board, we were staying over on the New York side and going to U U.S. ports. But then we had to clear customs. Customs was really easy to do up there. You basically just go and you call them, uh, give them your passport numbers, and I, I, I think if you're on some kind of matrix, they may come and inspect you, but they didn't even inspect us or anything. Uh, and then we started our trip back. So we backtracked a little bit, went up by Clayton and Alexandria, was that little Harvard trip when we were there? There's beautiful castles and just gorgeous places on the, uh, the uh, Thousand Islands. This was a, a nice oversized chair we found. <laughs> It was also interesting for me, too, because a lot of these ships are ships that call up in Searsport. So I would see ships that I, that I knew from past. So now we're in with the, the big boys. This is the, the seven canals on uh, the St. Lawrence. They are both run by Canada and U.S. This is the, their first two are Canadian, and then after that they're U.S. This is a lot different here. These are big, big locks. And they usually won't let yachts go in if there's a ship in there. The ship will, and they have run away. So you could be there conceivably for a day or two waiting to be locked through. Because a ship's coming, another one's going, another one's coming, another one's going. They're not going to let you in. This one they did, this was a Canadian Coast Guard vessel. And so he gave permission for uh, seven or eight yachts to come in and lock up behind him. But uh, this one is really quite... This is the one that has the floating bollards that go up and down, because it's, it's really uh, pretty serious. And these take a little longer, Blake asked that question. These are big locks, <coughs> you know, on 45 feet or so at a time. And they were probably 20 minutes actually doing the water exchange. But, oh, and the funny thing too is for yachts, you have to get off at the end of the dock, go up and put your credit card in, and uh, get your ticket to go through. Well, that all worked well, except one, the credit card thing wouldn't work. So, I'm like, now what do you do? So I just went into the lock, and I had cash, and the guy comes on, and I said, I couldn't get a, and he goes, 
Do you have cash? <laughs> yeah. uh, they're, they're all looking at each other. And they weren't supposed to take cash, but they did. So. <laughs> and now you can see there's quite a few vessels in here, uh, and they tie up really tight, and you really got to watch what's going on because it's locking. But it's busy. There's ships moving everywhere. And that's another good reason not to do it at night. Um, so we would, we would stop every night. That's Larry come in, get ready to lock up somewhere. This is one of the castles on the 700 acre island. I can't remember the name of it. There was just some beautiful, beautiful castles. Do you remember that one, Trish? That was that name? Is that the name 700 acre? Not 700, uh, Thousand Islands. But was it Colt's castle? Yeah. What was it? Yeah. I think so, yeah, that sounds right. And then, uh, when we finally got down to, to near Montreal, Larry and Sharon got off, and then we continued on through the canal, and then uh, it was pretty amazing when you get to the lock right outside Montreal. We were gonna go into Montreal, but the current runs around nine knots with you, but that meant, like, here's Montreal. So for me to get there, I would have had to, like, turn around and then go into nine knots, which for me would be going backwards. So I just said, we're gonna pass on Montreal. <laughs> well, it was really fun on my boat. My boat would be doing 15 knots down the river. We were like screaming down the river. So, uh, there's these beautiful cathedrals all up and down. Trish and I had a really great stay after we were by ourselves again in a place called Contracour. It was just this gorgeous, beautiful, little, uh, tight little waterway in through, a very small village. And we had a lovely stay there, and the people were very friendly. So this was actually, and I don't know if Trish will agree with me, but this was my favorite part of the canal trip. This was, uh, when you get to Sorel, which is just uh, between Montreal and Quebec, and you, you bang a right, you're on the Ch Ch Chamblay Richelieu River. And that takes you towards Lake Champlain. And I didn't know until later in my life that you could go from Lake Champlain to the San Juan Seaway, but you can't. And it's really interesting because these are natural, uh, national prehistoric, uh, nationally preserved Canadian park system. And they're all hand cranked. And they have uh, these college age kids that are hired for the summer to do this. And my, my brother it, called them the lock maidens. <laughs> <laughs> they were the most fun kids. They were so cool. And the locks were beautiful. So this is just leaving the big waterway uh, at, at the end of the Chamblain Richelieu River and starting it. It was nine locks. And the locks uh, are hand cranked, and then they, uh, there's some bridges that are also swing bridges that they'll hand crank for you as you go. But I really enjoyed this waterway. It was so calm and beautiful. And Piper, you can tell, liked it very much. Yeah. This is what it looks like. So you talk about the, you know, the mule teams going alongside. Yeah. That's where they would have done that. Huh. Um, and this the controlling draft there was eight feet, interestingly enough. And, but you wouldn't want to pass another vessel uh, of any size because it's very tight. So they control that. They keep track of uh, which vessels are going where. I'm talking to one. Uh, so here you can see we've, we've been given rules to stay a certain distance back. And then this is the, the actual uh, natural uh, river that, that's, that's alongside of you. But you see how great that is? It's just so beautiful. So. All of a sudden, when I was putting these pictures together, I realized we stopped taking pictures after a while. <laughs> because it was just the two of us, we were really busy locking. So we, we went in, um, after we fin finished the Chamblay, we ended up, now we're in Lake Champlain. And that was our only kind of exciting thing. We, our, our guide said, when you get there, go to Rouse's Point and clear customs. You just call them. So we're busily, happily going along and go underneath this bridge, welcome to America. And all of a sudden this police cruiser comes out. <laughs> and they're going, it's going, go there, go there. So I looked over and way over on the side there was a, a, a blue light flashing with a trailer and a big dock. And we got in and it was really not a very welcoming thing to the United States. We had these two uh, uh, Border Patrol people that we're already using the, the technique to figure out, you know, divide Trish and I and talk to her and then talk to me. And, and one was good cop and one was bad cop and I got bad cop. And he, and he was all over it. He was all over it. He goes, 
you can't come into the United States without crossing borders. This is the border of Well, maybe you should put like an arrow. <laughs> like a flashing arrow. And he goes, didn't you see our flashing light? And I go, no, you're like a quarter of a mile away from me. I mean, that could be a police officer, you know, arresting somebody. So he was the bad cop. And then Trish had, oh, how did you like your, your visit? <laughs> So, and then at one point I, I pulled out my, uh, what they call an MFC, Merchant Mariner document, and my passport. So all of a sudden they gave me a little bit of street cred that I actually was somebody with some experience, and that I really wasn't trying to bring drugs across the border. Uh, but it was interesting. So, after that we went down Lake Champlain, and we were sort of uh, getting what Mariners call channel fever. Uh, we were ready to start going home. And so we didn't stay long in Champlain. It was pretty. Uh, we stayed at a place called Bay Point, Point Bay. Point Bay. Point Bay. Point Bay. It was beautiful. Uh, nice swimming. Yeah, the temperatures were getting a little better. There was a breeze. Uh, but we were heading into the Champlain Canal, which <coughs> is a very beautiful canal, but quite uh, quite long. It's 60, 70 miles long, and that was the one that had the altitude issue. And we, we went by the place where it was the third place we'd seen on our trip where the locals. Chamber of Commerce had put up a sign saying, this is the site of the decisive Revolutionary War battle. <laughs> Every saw, town. We saw it on the Erie Canal at Worst and we saw it twice on the Champlain Canal. The decisive battle. Yeah. We were scratching our heads. Yeah. The chambers have no way to figure that all out. So this is, this is on the Chamblay Canal. It was very pretty. This was the only place I saw any commercial traffic. Uh, there were several barges that went through, and they do it at night. So they don't interfere with the yachts that are traveling there, and they were doing uh, sand removal, dredging operations. And this was a real, real pretty spot. I had a great group of them. Uh, this is starting to enter into the Champlain. These aren't quite in order. That's entering the Champlain Canal. I mean, the Champlain Canal. And these are guys that go along and mow up the, the grass uh, to keep the waterways open, and also it's commercially viable. So it's literally like an, an ocean lawnmower. <laughs> Talk about. <laughs> this, this is when we finally made it to Waterford. And by this time I had no crew except Trish and I, and I had to drop that mast. So I'm sitting there and I, I knew it, it takes three people. And I saw these two high school kids and I said, you guys want to earn $25 for 15 minutes worth of work? And they were all in. <laughs> So we got, we, we got the mast back up, and now we're back ready to go to sea. So now we've closed the kite. We've gone all the way around back to where we started at Troy Waterford. And then it was head, head down the river. We needed to be back at a certain time, so we really kind of steamed back down the river. We stopped in Albany and got fuel. We stopped at a couple of marinas. We stopped in Kingston. Kingston. Great Marine Museum. Great Marine Museum in Kingston. We love that. We uh, we had a couple places that uh, the weather was starting to turn, which we had been very lucky. We hadn't had much weather, but right about as we got about halfway down the, the uh, Hudson, just the two of us, three of us, I don't know. Uh, it started to get southeast, and I realized that people in New York don't add well. Uh, like if it says 10 knots, you, you actually want to add 15 more to that. Uh, it was 25 knots southeast. It was really getting kind of choppy, going underneath the, what's the name of the... Uh, Tappan Z. Oh. It was getting kind of exciting down there. Well, and can I just say that I thought it was exciting. John did not think it was exciting because he was so busy talking on the radio with all of his former students. The <laughs> 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 riding his hugs around. <laughs> well, you make it sound like I wasn't paying attention. Actually, one of, our, one, of our, one of our roughest parts of the trips was very interesting. In New York City, we're coming downbound, and for a lot of the mariners in the room here, they probably appreciate more than I did the uh, tide against the wind phenomena off the, uh, the battery. Once we got down to the battery, uh, we were literally were like burying the bow of our boat. I was only going four knots. People on the sidewalk were walking faster than me, <laughs> and we were just like going boom. And I knew I could see the end in sight. When you get up around the battery, you turn up the East River. It's all good because now you're in, you know, you're with the current and shelter. But it was a nightmare. And then to add to it, there's a thousand boats, uh, tourist boats, ferries, and they're putting out their own wake. So you're going like this, and then all these other waves are coming like that. So we were not having a very good time there, but uh, it was fun. All of so I'm closing on the end of the trip. Uh, we 
Trish and I scooted right along. We went through New York, Long Island Sound. We, because of the weather, we went mostly on the Long Island side. And then we cut across over to uh, Point Judith, and that's where we did our next crew change. And it was really great uh, to know that we were main bound. So Trish and the, the dog departed, and I, uh, I got two of my good shipmates, uh, Dr. Jim and uh, Hannah Gray, and that was our delivery crew back. And so we were uh, kind of going the Merchant Mariner route now. We were uh, going into the night. Uh, we made it up to Sandwich the first day uh, on the canal. And then we did a rum line, which is uh, straight. We went from uh, Sandwich straight, straight to Portland. And that was, you know, getting up early, early in the morning and getting in, you know, late, fairly late at night. That's my salty picture. Well, this is one picture. I'm, I'm going to stop here because this is one picture. This is a bridge in the St. Lawrence Seaway that didn't man, uh, didn't respond to yachts. So the bridge is down, and I come up, and I'm calling him, calling him, calling him, and nothing happened. So Larry and Sharon and I were just sitting there waiting for something to happen. And then finally the ship's coming the other way, and the bridge goes up. And so I like, <laughs> 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 so that's, that concludes my talk. Uh, I would be glad to answer questions. Uh, John, that's a question.